Hi, it's Dr. Z. In this video, I will review the second type of t-test. By the end of this video, you'll be able to conduct a two-tailed t-test for dependent means. Please print the corresponding handout for this video, and feel free to pause the video at any time to take notes on the handout. A t-test allows researchers to conduct a hypothesis test when population variance, sigma squared, is not known. There are three different types of t-tests. The second type is known as a t-test for dependent means. In its simplest form, the sample will be tested twice, like having a pre-test and a post-test. In other words, the sample is dependent on themselves because we're testing if there's a difference before and after a drug or treatment. This video will explain how researchers can do that. The second type of t-test is called a t-test for dependent means. First, the t refers to the fact that we do not know population variance. Second, the word test refers to a hypothesis test. Third, dependent, like I mentioned before, refers to the sample being tested twice. And fourth, we will calculate the sample mean of the difference between those pre- and post-test scores. When all put together, this is the definition for a t-test for dependent means. This test is also referred to as a related samples t-test. In this case, related refers to the fact that the sample is being tested twice or that they're related. Before we review the hypothesis test, there are two important concepts about this t-test that need to be reviewed first. Since the sample is being tested twice, the researcher is interested in the difference between the first score and the second score. Different scores measure the amount of change or difference between the pre-test and the post-test score, or between the before and after scores. To measure the difference between these two scores, we will subtract the post-test score and the pre-test score. Like two paths in the forest that lead into one single path, different scores turn two sets of scores into one set or one sample of scores to conduct the t-test. Since this is a t-test for dependent means, we need to review what the sample mean is in this test. Once the different scores are calculated, we then need to calculate the mean of these different scores using the following formula. Here is an example that illustrates how pre- and post-test scores are converted to different scores. Using the hy hypothetical drug called Medication Z, we want to see what effect it has on anxiety. We have a sample of four college students here who are currently anxious but are not on anti any, any anti-anxiety medication. They'll take their pre-test before they start treatment. Then they'll take medication Z for about eight weeks. Then they'll take their post-test. Then different scores will be calculated. These different scores here will be added up and divided by the N to get the mean of these different scores. These different scores would then be used in the t-test for dependent means. With that introduction to a t-test for dependent means, let's get started with the hypothesis test. You've seen this diagram multiple times by now. This diagram illustrates the process of hypothesis testing. We will use the same four steps in conducting a t-test for dependent means, with some modifications along the way. Step one, the yellow Lego, is to state hypotheses. The blue star indicates that there is a significant modification to the hypotheses. The word of the day, or <laughs> at least the word for this test, is difference. Since the sample is being tested twice, the researcher needs to determine if there's any difference between the pre-test and the post-test scores. The researcher then calculates the mean or average of the different scores. Therefore, the written statement for hypotheses must include the wording on average. Since we're calculating the average of the different scores, 
then the notation will also reflect this difference. In notation, it will be mu subscript d, where the d stands for, you get it, different scores. If there's no difference between the pretest and post-test scores, once the average is calculated, then mu d will always equal zero. In other words, if there truly is no difference between the first score and the second score, it will average out to be zero. The research hypothesis will reflect the wording on average as well. And in notation, if there is a difference between the first score and second score, the average will not equal zero. This is the step that typically confuses students, so just keep practicing. Step two, the blue Lego, is to set the criteria to make a decision. Well, guess what? Fortunately, this step stays the same as it would for our first t-test, the t-test for a single sample. Step three, the red Lego, is to collect data and calculate sample statistics. This step actually mostly remains the same as it would for a t-test for a single sample. First, we will calculate estimated population variance, which is the same formula as the t-test before. Second, we will calculate estimated standard error, which again is the same formula as the t-test before. Third, we will calculate the t-score for the sample mean of different scores, which is a slight variation from the previous t-test. It is basically the same formula with mu subscript d instead here to reflect that we're comparing the difference scores. The blue star indicates that this is an important modification to the t-score formula. Step four, the green Lego, is making a decision about whether the study worked or not. Guess what? <laughs> This step stays the same as it would for a t-test for a single sample. Wow, now that we, that we have reviewed the steps of a t-test for dependent means, are you ready to practice your new knowledge? I have one practice example for you to review. This is a short summary of the four steps that we described above. Please note that these steps are for a two-tailed t-test for dependent means. Modifications for this test are noted in bold. Please pause the video to write the, down these steps on the video handout. This lecture example wants to study the effect of the new drug called Medication Z on anxiety. Since we do not know what effect Medication Z will have on anxiety, we will conduct a two-tailed test with non-directional hypotheses. The details of this research study are also provided in your video handout. A sample of n equals 5 students take the anxiety inventory as a pretest. After 8 weeks of treatment with medication Z, the sample takes the anxiety inventory again. After calculating the different scores and taking the mean of those different scores, the sample had a mean of negative 4 on anxiety and a sum of squares of 50. I encourage you to pause the video here and try to do the four steps on your own first. Then resume the video to show the answers. Step one. Since we're studying the average of the difference in anxiety before and after medication Z, the hypotheses will include these variables. Since we're interested in the difference between pre and post test scores, and we then take the mean or average of those different scores, we will use D to refer to different scores. In notation, if there is no difference between the pre and post test scores, once the average is calculated, then mu D equals zero. The research hypothesis will reflect that there is a difference on average, and in notation, if there is a difference, between the pre and the post test scores, once the average is calculated, the mu d does not equal zero. Most importantly here, these hypotheses should say the words on average 
and use the word no difference or difference because we're comparing the pre and the post test scores. So let's go to step two. As a researcher, we get to decide the significance level and the preferred one is a 0.05. Second, we'll calculate degrees of freedom, which is four. Since we do not know if medication Z will increase or decrease anxiety, we need to draw a critical region T for both tails, above and below the mean. The corresponding T scores for a 0.05 significance level with a degrees of freedom four is T plus or minus 776. The box indicates the final answer that I will be looking for on problem sets and exams. Because the T table provides scores to three decimal places, you may keep the answer to three decimal places. Step three. Since we do not know population variance, sigma squared, we need to estimate both variance and standard error. So first we will calculate estimated population variance. Then we will calculate estimated standard error. And third, we will use the slightly modified, slightly modified T-score formula that allows us to compare our sample mean with mu D. Recall that in the null hypothesis we stated that mu D equals zero if there's no difference between the pretest and post-test score. Well, guess what? Then all we have to do is plug in zero for mu d. We then calculate using these values, and the t-score for the sample is that t equals negative 2.53. The box indicates the final answer. So step four. Now we need to compare that sample t-score that we calculated in step three to the population prediction which we determine in step two. In other words, does our t-score fall in the critical region from step two? Since it actually does not fall in the critical region, it's close, the answer is no, and the decision is to fail to reject the null hypothesis. The box indicates the final answer that I'll be looking for. More specifically, the t-score for the sample was a negative score, which is below the mean, so it looks like anxiety decreased, but it approached significance. After a hypothesis test is conducted, the researcher must calculate effect size, as well as report and interpret the results of the study. Now, let's briefly calculate effect size for this t-test. First, we'll calculate s. Second, we will use our estimated D formula. Now, mu in this formula is going to refer to mu D, which is zero. So then we just input a zero, and we get this final answer. While the estimated D results in a negative value, we always report effect size as a positive value. The box indicates the final numerical answer that will be reported in the summary statement. Please see the chart from chapter six to determine whether the size of the effect is small, medium, or large, and that this verbal description will be used in the interpretation statement. Finally, you know we can't get away without doing summary and interpretation statements. I encourage you to pause the video here and try to write these statements down on your own first, then resume the video to show the answers. The summary statement will consist of two sentences. The first sentence will report the mean of the sample and indicate that it is an average of the different scores. The second sentence will report the t-score, the degrees of freedom, the significance level used, the decision you made, and the effect size estimated d. The second sentence must also include the word difference because you're comparing the difference between pre and post test scores. The interpretation statement will explain that anxiety decreased, but it was not statistically significant. You may also choose to use approach significance in this statement as well. 
the second sentence will explain the effect size. And, well, since the t-score was close to falling in the critical region for a sample of five students, there will be an additional sentence here that should include a repeat of the study with a larger sample size. In summary, research studies may want to explore the difference before and after treatment for the same sample. This requires taking the average of the different scores. A t-test for dependent means allows for the study of pre- and post-test comparisons of a single sample. Learning how to conduct a t-test for dependent means is one more important Lego building block needed to understand statistics.